Hello YouTube, Bane666 here. So anyway, in the last uh, month or two, a YouTuber called Garrett has put up a couple of videos about the men's rights movement. Uh, some of the stuff he says isn't too bad, and some of it's way off. Uh, so I thought I'd do a response video in which I go through his arguments and um, pull them apart. The first one I'm going to start with, oh boy, yep. Uh, Garrett goes full Macintosh with this one. I think I'll just play the clip first and then I'll go through the clip and break it down and uh, point out the mistakes that he's made. So uh, let's get stuck into it. They talk about false rape accusations like they are this gargantuan crisis of a problem, when the reality is that only between 2 and 8% of rape accusations are false. Some people might be thinking now that that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of them. After all, there are a staggering amount of rapes, but that is my point. The MRA focus on false accusations and disregard and lack of concern for actual rape comes across as callous, bigoted, extremely ideologically motivated, and intellectually dishonest. And I'm not just talking about consent courses or trying to decrease the amount of rape. The other big side of this issue is that 97% of people that go to court for rape don't get convicted. People who the, you know, the prosecution and the police both think did it, not just the victim. You know, there's no other crime with, with such a staggeringly low conviction rate. It's crazy. If you look at the placards held by feminist protesters at MRA conferences and such, a large proportion of them are about our frustration with this false rape claim myth. So this is an example of a disingenuous MRA issue that alienates potentially very useful allies to the genuine activism many MRAs are interested in. Yeah, so I wonder how many of you actually picked the mistakes. There was one huge one in particular, uh, <laughs> which we'll get to in a minute. But let's, um, let's have a look at that clip again, bit by bit. They talk about false rape accusations like they are this gargantuan crisis of a problem, when the reality is that only between 2 and 8% of rape accusations are false. Oh boy, how did I know that the 2 to 8% figure was going to be brought up? It's always brought up. I'm, to be honest, I'm kind of a, a little bit sick of debunking it, and uh, I'm, I'm guessing that... Uh, regular viewers to my channel are probably sick of me debunking it as well. But as Garrett obviously has never heard my debunking, uh, I'm going to have to do it yet again. So let's have a look at an article from the Bloomberg View titled, How Many Rape Reports Are False? Here's what we do know. The 2% number is very bad and should never be cited. It apparently traces its lineage back to Susan Brown Miller's legendary Against Our Will. And her citation for this figure is a single speech by an appellate judge before a small group of lawyers. His source for this statistic was a single area of New York that started having police women conduct all rape interviews. This is not data. It is an anecdote about an anecdote. But so should any other numbers, such as the 8% figure that is commonly attributed to the FBI. When you dig into the research itself, you find it is often heavily inflected with the author's prior beliefs about what constitutes the real problem, unreported cases of rape or false reports. Okay, but I'll tell you what, let's be fair, and just for argument's sake, let's play devil's advocate and say that the 2 to 8% figure, as Garrett suggests, is in fact legitimate. Are we really to believe that the police detect every single case of false allegation. Now, as I'll discuss later in this video, it is often hard to prove that someone is a victim of rape. I would argue that it is equally hard to prove that someone has been falsely accused. Now, there are cases where someone has an alibi, there, there's been cases where someone's uh, you know, in another town and they're working and they can prove that they weren't at a particular spot at a particular time and they can prove that the allegation is false. But what most rape cases come down to is one person's word against another. And this can be very hard to prove who's telling the truth and who is lying. So let me ask the question again. Are we really to believe that every single false accusation has been detected and accounted for by police and that it is only 8% therefore 
The simple truth is that we do not know what the actual number is. It could be low, it could be high, it could be somewhere in the middle. We actually don't know. It's what's called a dark number. And let me go on the record here for saying that anyone who claims to know for a fact what percentage of rape cases are in fact false allegations is full of shit. Anyone who claims to know with any degree of accuracy what percentage of rape claims are false is full of shit because it is a number which is impossible to prove one way or the other. And look, that goes for MRAs or feminists or anyone who doesn't belong to either camp. If you claim to know for a fact what the number is or with any degree of accuracy, you are full of shit. And even if we were to consider the 8% to be a correct number, that would still roughly be 1 in 12 cases. I don't know about you, but 1 in 12 cases doesn't sound that insignificant to me. Uh, but let's continue. Some people might be thinking now that that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of them. After all, there are a staggering amount of rapes, but that is my point. The MRA focus on false accusations and disregard and lack of concern for actual rape comes across as callous, bigoted, extremely ideologically motivated, and intellectually dishonest. Lack of concern for actual rape? Well, that's interesting because uh, we're one of the few groups who talk about male victims of rape and how um, forced to penetrate isn't even considered rape, even though you have someone who is being forced into a sex act against their will. And I personally, numerous times, have talked about lesbian rape, uh, the percentage of which is considerably high. But it's strange that feminists only ever seem to talk about rape when there is a male perpetrator. They talk about almost exclusively male-on-female rape, and they occasionally talk about male-on-male -male rape, but they never ever bring up female-on-female -female rape or female-on-male rape. It's almost as if they don't want to talk about female perpetrators. It's almost as if they're using rape as an excuse to demonize males and masculinity. Now, obviously not all feminists are like this. There are a handful of feminists who actually are concerned about female victims of females. And there are some, although not that many that I've seen, who are concerned about male victims of females and actually take that serious. There seems to be at least an equal number who believe that males can't be raped by females or that because males have privilege in society then that they can't be raped or it somehow doesn't affect them the same way and that only women can be raped because uh, patriarchy or some such nonsense. Now what I would like is a serious discussion about all types of rape and all rape victims including uh, those in prison who are often forgotten about or joked about or we hear, uh, but that's men doing it to men. So therefore it doesn't count. It seems to be a pretty common feminist reply to a lot of male issues for some reason. But why can't we talk about all types of rape and all rape victims? Why is it that feminism has to mainly focus, almost exclusively focus, on a dynamic where males are the aggressors and females are the victims. Why well, it's almost like that's what feminism is built upon, that dynamic, isn't it? How strange. And if we are going to talk about all victims and all types of rape, then we should also talk about false allegations. And we should also stick to actual facts and not exaggerate figures which is a common feminist trait to exaggerate or misquote figures uh, as we're about to see uh, by all means take it away Garrett 
And I'm not just talking about consent courses or trying to decrease the amount of rape. The other big side of this issue is that 97% of people that go to court for rape don't get convicted. People who the, you know, the prosecution and the police both think did it, not just the victim. You know, there's no other crime with, with such a staggeringly low conviction rate. It's crazy. Uh, yeah. I always find it rather amusing when when somebody takes the time and effort to actually debunk themselves. <laughs> it kind of makes my job um, so much easier. Uh, but just in case you missed it, let's listen to one little bit of that audio again. ...is that 97% of people that go to court for rape don't get convicted. People... 97% of people who go to court for rape aren't convicted. Wow, you know, that, that sounds pretty shocking, but uh, let's have a look at the three images that Garrett himself put up during that particular statement. Now, the first one of the three I'll look at is this one. And it clearly states that 2,910 people a year face court proceedings and then it says underneath 1070 people a year are convicted of rape now my math is a little bit rusty i don't tend to use math that much anymore but even with my rusty math i don't know if 1070 is three percent of 2910 just off the top of my head that doesn't seem correct so I thought I would do a rough calculation using my very rusty math skills and if my rusty math skills are correct it turns out to be about 36.7 percent and 36.7 percent uh, is a very long way away from three percent uh, do you see my problem here, Garrett? But but hold on, hold on. He did show two other images as well, so I guess, in fairness, we should have a look at them and see what they've got to say. Maybe they support the 3%. So he uses this image from Rain. So it says, seven lead to an arrest, three are referred to prosecution, and two lead to a felony conviction. So two out of three... It would be two-thirds, would it not? But I tell you what, let's give Garrett best-case scenario. Let's, let's say uh, those who are arrested. So two out of seven, uh, it's under a third, but similar to the previous number. And so, you know, let, let's be fair and say somewhere between one-third and two-thirds. Still miles away from three percent, isn't it, Garrett? Ah, and then there's the last image he showed us during that part, in which it clearly says 40% of prosecuted rapes are convicted. 40%, Garrett. This is your own image that you're using in your video, <laughs> which you put up seconds after you claim that only 3% are prosecuted. Do you not understand the difference between 3% and 40%? So what Garrett has done here is he's taken all claims of rape and he's bundled them all into the into those cases which are prosecuted and concluded that only 3% go to jail. Not 3% out of all claims of rape, including the 68% using his own figures, which aren't reported to police. But he claims that this 3% comes from those that go to prosecution and go to court. Uh, which his own figures don't support. So a question to you, Garrett. Um, if 68% of rapes aren't reported to police, how exactly are they meant to end in a conviction? Now, look, I'm guessing Garrett has just made a mistake here. I think if he had have done it on purpose, then he wouldn't have been so stupid as to use graphics which, which uh, counteract his claims. So I'm guessing it was just a... A mistake on his his part but this is part of the problem this is what we have to deal with all the fucking time is figures constantly being misrepresented 
constantly being taken out of context, constantly being exaggerated and twisted. Now, look, I do think rape is a problem. I think it is a very serious problem which needs to be addressed and, and something obviously needs to be done about it. But we don't do that by making up bullshit. Do you not understand that weakens your case? Do you not understand exaggerations and misquotes and misrepresentations do not, su to, do not support the, the case for dealing with rape? They actually weaken it. You, Garrett, are part of the problem because of this. Now, if you were the only one to do this, I would just write it off as a slip of the tongue and a mistake. But this is common. This is something we see all the fucking time. Fuck, you guys really need to get your act together and stop misquoting and exaggerating things. You don't deal with actual issues by doing that. But let's have another look at one of these graphics that Garrett puts up. And I'll address his point as if he, he didn't misquote the figures or have a slip of the tongue or whatever. Let, let's be totally fair. And the 40% here is similar to the 36.7% figure I figured out. So let's go with 40%. So let's assume that 40% of prosecuted rapes end in the conviction, right? So that means 60% don't. Now, Garrett's big argument is, let's compare that to other crimes, and we find that the number is far less. And there's some examples here. Burglary, for example, which has a number of 70%. Now, it's not really fair to compare these two things, because they're very, very different type of crime. If someone breaks into your house, uh, they're likely to have broken a window, um, your belongings are likely to be stolen, they might be caught in the act, but even if they're not, there's evidence left of a crime. If the person is caught in possession of your belongings, and you can prove that they're your belongings, then there is evidence of a crime. Uh, but what about rape? What, what evidence is there of rape? Well, unless there are actual witnesses, then the only evidence there is for rape is that sex took place. Now, sex itself is not illegal. Sex is an act which happens all the time. It's probably happening right now in your neighborhood. And the vast majority of the time, that sex is consensual and legal. The only time it is illegal is when there is not consent. So proof of sex is not proof of non-consent. And for that matter, it's not proof of consent either. All it proves is that sex took place. Once again, most of the time, when sex takes place, it is perfectly legal. What makes rape different is consent or lack of. That's what needs to be proven in court. And how, how do you prove lack of consent? Unless there is uh, videotaped evidence or eyewitnesses, how exactly do you prove that there was not consent? What it comes down to is one person's word against another. One person says there wasn't consent, and the other person says there was consent. So who do you believe? Now, obviously, this makes prosecuting rape cases extremely hard. It's not like we live in the world of the X-Men where there's telepaths who can read people's minds, and we all know that lie detectors aren't exactly reliable. So how exactly do you tell who is telling the truth when all you have is one person's word against another? If you look at the placards held by feminist protesters at MRA conferences and such, a large proportion of them are about our frustration with this false rape claim myth. So this is an example of a disingenuous MRA issue that alienates potentially very useful allies to the genuine activism many MRAs are interested in. Now, I have to ask you, Garrett, have you actually listen to why we talk about false rape allegations. Let me tell you one of the reasons why we talk about false allegations so often. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of the present situation in universities in America. It's not very good. But I tell you what, instead of me telling you about it, why don't I get a feminist to tell you all about it? Judith Grossman, a mother, a feminist, aghast.
unsubstantiated accusations against my son by a former girlfriend landed him before a nightmarish college tribunal. I am a feminist. I have marched at the barricades, subscribed to Ms. Magazine, and knocked on many a door in support of progressive candidates committed to women's rights. Until a month ago, I would have expressed unqualified support for Title IX and for the Violence Against Women Act. But that was before my son, a senior at a small liberal arts college in New England, was charged, by an ex-girlfriend, with alleged acts of non-consensual sex that supposedly occurred during the course of their relationship a few years earlier. What followed was a nightmare, a fall through Alice's looking glass into a world that I could not possibly have believed existed, least of all behind the ivy-covered walls thought to protect an ostensible dedication to enlightenment and intellectual betterment. It began with a text of desperation. Call me. Urgent. Now. That was how my son informed me that not only had charges been brought against him but that he was ordered to appear to answer these allegations in a matter of days. There was no preliminary inquiry on the part of anyone at the school into these accusations about behavior alleged to have taken place a few years earlier, no consideration of the possibility that jealousy or revenge might be motivating a spurned young ex-lover to lash out. Worst of all, my son would not be afforded a presumption of innocence. In fact, Title IX, that so-called guarantor of equality between the sexes on college campuses, and as applied by a recent directive from the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, has obliterated the presumption of innocence that is so foundational to our traditions of justice. On today's college campuses, neither, beyond a reasonable doubt, nor even the lesser, by clear and convincing evidence standard of proof is required to establish guilt of sexual misconduct. These safeguards of due process have, by order of the federal government, been replaced by what is known as a preponderance of the evidence. What this means, in plain English, is that all my son's accused are needed to establish before a campus tribunal is that the allegations were more likely than not to have occurred by a margin of proof that can be as slim as 50.1% to 49.9%. How does this campus tribunal proceed to evaluate the accusations? Upon what evidence is it able to make a judgment? The frightening answer is that like the proverbial 800-pound gorilla, the tribunal does pretty much whatever it wants, showing scant regard for fundamental fairness, due process of law, and the well-established rules and procedures that have evolved under the Constitution for citizens' protection. Who knew that American college students are required to surrender the Bill of Rights at the campus gates? My son was given written notice of the charges against him in the form of a letter from the campus Title IX officer. But instead of affording him the right to be fully informed, the separately listed allegations were a barrage of vague statements, rendering any defense virtually impossible. The letter lacked even the most basic information about the acts alleged to have happened years before. Nor were the allegations supported by any evidence other than the word of the ex-girlfriend. The hearing itself was a two-hour ordeal of unabated grilling by the school's committee during which, my son later reported, he was expressly denied his request to be represented by counsel or even to have an attorney outside the door of the room. The questioning, he said, ran far afield even from the vaguely stated allegations contained in the so-called notice. Questions from the distant past, even about unrelated matters, were flung at him with no opportunity for him to give thoughtful answers. The many pages of written documentation that my son had put together, which were directly on point about his relationship with his accuser during the time period of his alleged wrongful conduct, were dismissed as somehow not relevant. What was relevant, however, according to the committee, was the unsworn testimony of witnesses deemed to have observable knowledge about the long-ago relationship between my son and his accuser. That the recollections of these young people made under intense peer pressure and with none of the safeguards consistent with fundamental fairness, were relevant, while records of the accuser's email and social media postings were not, made a mockery of the very term. While my son was instructed by the committee not to discuss this matter with any potential witnesses, these witnesses against him were not identified to him, nor was he allowed to confront or question either them or his accuser. Thankfully, I happened to be an attorney and had the resources to provide the necessary professional assistance to my son. 
The charges against him were ultimately dismissed but not before he and our family had to suffer through this ordeal. I am of course relieved and most grateful for this outcome. Yet I am also keenly aware not only of how easily this all could have gone the other way, with life-altering consequences, but how all too often it does. Across the country and with increasing frequency, innocent victims of impossible to substantiate charges are afforded scant rights to fundamental fairness and find themselves entrapped in a widening web of this latest surge in political correctness. Few have a lawyer for a mother, and many may not know about the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which assisted me in my research. There are very real and horrifying instances of sexual misconduct and abuse on college campuses and elsewhere. That these offenses should be investigated and prosecuted where appropriate is not open to question. What does remain a question is how we can make the process fair for everyone. I fear that in the current climate the goal of women's rights, with the compliance of politically motivated government policy and the tacit complicity of college administrators, runs the risk of grounding our most cherished institutions in a veritable snake pit of injustice, not unlike the very injustices the movement itself has for so long sought to correct. Unbridled feminist orthodoxy is no more the answer than our attitudes and policies that victimize the victim. Now, I don't know you, Garrett. I really don't know what type of person you are, but I seriously hope you are as horrified by that as I am. Uh, if you're any decent type of person, I think you would be. This is the very foundation of our legal system being thrown away here, as if it's nothing. Uh, I seriously hope you have an issue with this. And let's imagine a scenario for a second. Imagine a dead body was found on a university campus. Now what would happen is someone would call the police, they would turn up, they would cordon off the area, specialists would come in and collect evidence, it might be DNA, might be a weapon. These specialists have years of experience and, and training. Then the police in charge of the investigation might interview people, might go through the evidence with a fine tooth comb, check alibis and eventually come up with a, a list of suspects. This might take weeks, it could take months. Eventually with any luck it would end in a court case and the suspect would go to court with a lawyer. He or she would have legal representation and it would take the evidence to convict that person, not just someone's word. Now imagine the universities did it a different way. They just decided one day that why go through all that, that trouble with uh, you know the police and and all the other stuff. If if they found a dead body on campus, um, why not just get I don't know uh, someone from the chemistry lab and maybe a professor from gender studies and I don't know maybe the dean, possibly the janitor. Who knows? And we'll put them in a panel and we'll just let them decide who they find guilty based on, I don't know, their feelings. Maybe they might have asked someone some questions or something. Would you think that would be a better way to do justice? Uh, I think just about everyone would agree that that would be fucking crazy. Yet that's how universities are treating rape instead of getting experts with training and years of experience to investigate it, instead of having a court case where they can look at all the evidence and people can have legal representation, instead of going to all that trouble, uh, why not just get a, some faculty together and uh, we'll let them decide. And of course, if the rapist is guilty, all he gets is kicked out of the university, which is hardly a uh, proper sentence is it on the other hand if he's innocent well he hasn't really had a fair trial has he and when it comes down to just someone's word and there's no consequence for for lying actually there's no well there's no uh, real opportunity to determine if someone's lying is there uh, but even if you did there's no no real consequences you kind of open the floodgates for people to do this type of thing you know out of revenge or if they've got emotional issues or but you know what Garrett 
uh, this actually gets a lot worse far far worse recently the men's rights crowd over at reddit did some awesome online activism occidental college in los angeles california set up an online sexual violence anonymous reporting form and just like the name suggests it's an anonymous online form where anyone can report anyone else of sexual violence now this flies in the face of the right for one to face their accuser However, proponents of the forum say that that's not the case, as no one named on the forum will be subject to any actual discipline. Instead, if a perpetrator is named, a member of the Dean of Students office will meet with that person to share that the person was named in an anonymous report, review the sexual misconduct policy, and inform the person that if the allegations are true, the behavior needs to cease immediately. That sounds like a blacklist to me, and it sounded like a blacklist to the guys over at Our Men's Rights. Uh, so they decided to flood the system with anonymous accusations of their own, thereby demonstrating just how easy it is to lie about someone when you don't have to have to provide your own identity. Many feminists, including David Futrell, were outraged that anyone would do anything so dreadful. Maybe they decided these guys were worse than two Hitlers because that's what, what always happens when MRAs pull off any kind of effective activism. Or maybe it's because uh, Lauren Carella, the college's Title IX coordinator, uh, was recently accused publicly of meeting with two students and one faculty member uh, for after they used the form. And this was the perfect way to distract from that. I don't know, maybe it's one of those two. I don't know. Well, isn't that fantastic? I'm sure that that won't be abused in any way whatsoever. I'm sure there's no one out there who would maybe leave someone's name to get revenge or as a joke or who knows. I'm sure that would never, ever, ever happen. I mean, why would that happen when there's absolutely no consequences? But tell you what, let's look at this logically. Firstly, if what the form says is true, that they're just called into the office and have a bit of a talking to, that's hardly an appropriate response to someone who is actually a rapist, is it? Of course, the other possibility is that, as Nick suggests, they go on a blacklist. And in this case, um, I really wouldn't want to be an innocent man accused on one of those blacklists. I mean, how exactly would you prove your innocence? You don't even know who accused you. And you have no no opportunity to prove your innocence. Not that you should have to prove your innocence. They should actually have to prove you guilty. But, you know, who gives a shit about the cornerstone of our legal system, right? And what exactly is the point of an anonymous accusation I mean, an actual guilty rapist uh, would actually know who he's raped, wouldn't he? Uh, so, so the protection of the identity of the accuser is... Um, how, how exactly is that going to help? But, of course, if you're an innocent man, <laughs> you would have no fucking clue who has accused you. I mean, you might have an idea. It might be an ex or someone you've pissed off or something. I mean, who knows? Now, Garrett, I don't know if you're familiar with Sage Gerard. He's an MRA who recently graduated university. While at university, he tried to start a men's rights group, a, an equality group, which was non-feminist. Not anti-feminist, but non-feminist. And he received nothing but accusations and hassles and threats and all kinds of stuff a lot of them actually coming from staff um, uh, to my knowledge he was never actually accused of rape uh, but I imagine if this form was <laughs> was live at that university uh, there would have been a lot of accusations as a silencing technique just to make him shut up and go away so uh, this was actually a recent development. Uh, over like past 2014, and during 2014, I've been like the subject of like four police reports uh, from just various uh, the the usual crowd for uh, my own activism, but accused of basically having genocidal ideations and other bullshit. But uh, some other uh, professor on Kennesaw State University just in the last month accused me of plagiarizing my last major assignment. 
So uh, what I ended up having to do was uh, get into one last big fight in order to survive this campus because uh, if I didn't get past this issue, I would never be able to graduate. So it turns out this uh, one, there's this one professor on Kennesaw State named uh, Becky Rutherford. And uh, Rutherford is this really, really angry interim dean of the Honors College on campus. She, be she had this really uh, great idea where if uh, she took my last uh, capstone paper, which was a project I had to come up with and submit for approval, she would, she would go ahead and file this plagiarism accusation up to the point of saying that you could copy and paste entire paragraphs into Google and find uh, verbatim sources. You could not, but she did it anyway. And uh, interestingly enough, she would never actually cite the specific passages that were evidence of this. But uh, there was another whole other investigation that fired up as a result of this. And um, she would not, uh, she would, she would not uh, talk to me again under this pretense that I would be harassing her if I did. And uh, given the way that uh, attorneys on campus handled the previous professors of that nature, I just knew that I had to pretty much sit there and wait it out. And uh, thankfully, I survived. The, uh, the accusation fell flat again, and I think it's a good, just a good idea to basically drink myself half to death to celebrate. They never give up, do they? Never. It's always, never, it's always they, something. I, you see, the, the, the thing I don't get is you got this... I, I'm, I'm one of the fucking lucky ones. That's the thing. I'm one of the fucking lucky ones. You got all the, you've got students who lose their entire futures, right? Because they end up getting accused of something, and that's it. That's the end of their lives. They get either expelled or put in jail or worse. But I'm fucking graduating. <laughs> What you got to realize, Garrett, is that accusations can be used as a weapon. Now, I'm not saying all accusations are like this, but when you have a system which allows people to make accusations without consequences, if those accusations turn out to be false, then you invite people to abuse that system. It really is that simple. So, yeah, an anonymous reporting system where people don't even have to put their name to an allegation which has absolutely no consequences regarding a false allegation is inviting people to abuse the system it is inviting people to use it to get revenge it is inviting people to use it to silence people they don't like and it really isn't in any way going to help actual rape victims but all this bullshit actually gets even worse. From the Harvard Law Review. Trading the megaphone for the gavel in Title IX enforcement. I recently assisted a young man who was subjected by administrators at his small liberal arts university in Oregon to a month-long investigation into all his campus relationships, seeking information about his possible sexual misconduct in them, an immense invasion of his and his friend's privacy and who was ordered to stay away from a fellow student cutting him off from his housing, his campus job, and educational opportunity, all because he reminded her of the man who had raped her months before and thousands of miles away. He was found to be completely innocent of any sexual misconduct and was informed of the basis of the complaint against him only by accident and offhand. But the stay away order remained in place and was so broadly drawn up that he was at constant risk of violating it and coming under discipline for that. So we have a situation here where the person in question is totally innocent. I think we can all agree with that. There's no chance that this guy was guilty in any way. His only crime, apparently, was to look like someone who apparently is guilty. And that's enough for not only him to be investigated as a possible rapist, and to have his uh, life turned upside down, but to have restrictions placed on him, which will affect his living and education standards. What a fantastic system that is. Isn't that just fantastic? So you don't even have to be accused of rape to have consequences. I mean, this shit is just fucking crazy. I, I seriously hope you agree with me on this, Garrett. But you know what? It actually gets even worse than this. Believe it or not, there is an even worse case than this one. Man receives sex act while blacked out, gets accused of sexual assault. An Amherst College student blacked out, 
accompanied a fellow student back to her dorm room after drinking in February 2012. While he was blacked out, she performed oral sex on him. Nearly two years later, she would accuse him of sexual assault. And under Amherst's guilty until proven innocent, and even then, as we'll see, still guilty hearing standards, the accused student was expelled. The accused student choosing the pseudonym John Doe is suing the college for denying him due process. His lawyer had discovered text messages that proved the accused student did not initiate the encounter and in no way sexually assaulted the accuser. Despite this evidence, the college refused to reopen Doe's case. Casey Johnson, co-author of the book about the Duke lacrosse rape hoax, obtained Doe's lawsuit as well as transcripts from the hearing that found him guilty. Johnson first describes Amherst's Kafkaesque sexual assault rules, which stated goal is to empower victims during hearings rather than determine the truth. Johnson notes that the school has adopted the yes means yes definition of consent, meaning someone has to ask before performing any sexual act on another person and receive an affirmative response. But the standard provides no way for accused students to prove they obtained such consent. For that matter, given that the sexual act was performed on the accused student, was there any evidence he provided affirmative consent? The school also requires drunk students engaging in sexual activity to be aware of the other person's level of intoxication, and warns students that an individual may experience a blackout state in which he she they appear to be giving consent, but do not actually have conscious awareness or the ability to consent. Johnson asks how an accused student is supposed to have been aware of another's intoxication or known they were in a blackout state, as Amherst doesn't provide an explanation. The entire adjudication process at Amherst revised after another student claimed the school mistreated her sexual assault accusation, was designed to find guilt, Johnson wrote. An accused student may hire an attorney, but that attorney cannot say anything during the hearing. An accused student may receive a campus advisor who is not an advocate for the student. Meanwhile, the accuser's advisor is absolutely their advocate. For Doe, his advisor was an administrator who lacked tenure and was trained in social justice education. Doe was not allowed to directly cross-examine his accuser and could only write down questions for the panel to ask her, leaving no room for follow-ups. The hearing panel, meanwhile, was made up of student life officials and another administrators trained in social justice education, none of whom had tenure. The investigator of the sexual assault claim lacked the subpoena power to actually investigate. Had the investigator been able to properly investigate, they would have uncovered the text messages that proved there was no assault. This is one of the few cases where we have an actually good idea of what happened the night in question. Doe accompanied the accuser, who was Doe's girlfriend's roommate to her dorm room. The accuser performed oral sex on a blacked out Doe. Johnson notes that even the Amherst hearing found Doe's account of being blacked out credible. Doe leaves. The accuser then texted two people, first, a male student she had a crush on, whom she invited over after a heavily flirtatious exchange earlier in the evening. Then, a female friend. The accuser said during her hearing that she only texted one friend to help her handle the assault as she felt very alone and confused. But her texts with her female friend give no indication of an assault. Rather, the accuser texted her friend, Oh my god I just did something so fucking stupid. She then proceeded to fret that she had done something wrong and her roommate would never talk to her again, because, it's pretty obvious I wasn't an innocent bystander. She also complained that the other man, who had come over after the alleged assault, had taken until 5 in the morning to finally have sex with her. The accuser found herself friendless after the encounter, when her roommate discovered what she had done. Between the encounter with Doe and the accusation nearly two years later the accuser developed new friends. And as it happens, these new friends were all victims' advocates. When Doe discovered the text messages, he presented the findings to Amherst. The school refused to reopen his case. Casey Johnson sums up the case perfectly. Once again, this is a case in which an accuser, to put it charitably, misrepresented written evidence vital to her credibility, and this same material, her words, showed if anything that she initiated sexual contact against a student who even Amherst's panel described as blacked out, Johnson wrote.
and yet, according to Amherst, the accuser is a sexual assault survivor. The case also shows how a male student can be accused of sexual assault even if the evidence suggests he might have been the one assaulted. Wow, that uh, that poor, poor girl mm, being forced to perform sex on someone who's passed out. Yeah, and then, um, and then she does what we know all rape victims do. Uh, she she goes and finds another guy to sleep with. That's that's the first thing rape victims do, don't they? After they've been traumatized during a rape, is they uh, they go out and try to get laid. Yeah, maybe maybe not, maybe not. Um, may, maybe she's got no credibility at all. Maybe she's an actual fucking rapist, and uh, maybe instead of sending just men to consent classes, uh, maybe more women should go as well. What do you think? What do you think, Garrett? Would that be a good idea? But I have to ask you a question, Garrett. Where are the hordes of feminists who are sticking up for this rape victim? I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about the male rape victim. Not that what happened to him is um, legally rape, but let's face it, it should be. So where are the hordes of feminists sticking up for this guy? Where are the hordes of feminists defending him as a rape victim? <laughs> I, I don't see any. I don't recall hearing anyone on the feminist side sticking up for this guy or giving a shit about his rights, either as someone who's been falsely accused or as a rape victim. Do you not get now, Garrett, why we are concerned about this? Do you not understand why we find this a fucking problem? And it's not limited to just these cases that I've presented here today. There are presently hundreds of lawsuits across America with cases like this. And obviously not every one of these cases ends in a lawsuit. So you might ask, how exactly did we get to this position? How exactly did we arrive here where this lunacy is happening? You know what, that's, that's a very good question. This might be part of the answer. Classrooms, courts or neither? Students, administrators and lawyers argue over whether and how colleges should adjudicate campus assault cases at U of Virginia Conference on Sexual Misconduct. But for some in attendance, including Amanda Childress, Sexual Assault Awareness Program Coordinator at Dartmouth College, campus policies aren't going far enough to protect students. Why could we not expel a student based on an allegation? Childress asked at the panel before noting that while 2-8% to 8 of accusations are unfounded but not necessarily intentionally false, 90-95% to 95 are unreported, committed by repeat offenders, and intentional. It seems to me that we value fair and equitable processes more than we value the safety of our students. And higher education is not a right. Safety is a right. Higher education is a privilege. If we know that a person is reasonably a threat to our community, Childress said, why are we not removing them and protecting the safety of our students? Yeah, I mean, what, what a great point. Why would due process matter? Why would legal rights uh, be important, right? With little things like that. Um, yeah, apparently they, they're not all that important and um, you know, they're not really part of the big picture, are they? Uh, strangely. <sighs> But to find the origin of this, let's go back in time to 2001 to an article which appeared in Time magazine. Behavior, when is it rape? Out of this contention was born a set of arguments that have become politically correct wisdom on campus and in academic circles. This view holds that rape is a symbol of women's vulnerability to male institutions and attitudes. It's sociopolitical, insists Gina Rayfield, a New Jersey psychologist. In our culture men hold the power, politically, economically. They're socialized not to see women as equals. This line of reasoning has led some women, especially radicalized victims, to justify flinging around the term rape as a political weapon, referring to everything from violent sexual assaults to inappropriate innuendos. Ginny, a college senior who was really raped when she was 16, 
suggests that false accusations of rape can serve a useful purpose. Penetration is not the only form of violation, she explains. In her view, rape is a subjective term, one that women must use to draw attention to other, non-violent, even non-sexual forms of oppression. If a woman did falsely accuse a man of rape, she may have had reasons to, Ginny says. Maybe she wasn't raped, but he clearly violated her in some way. Catherine Comins, assistant dean of student life at Vassar, also sees some value in this loose use of rape. She says angry victims of various forms of sexual intimidation cry rape to regain their sense of power. To use the word carefully would be to be careful for the sake of the violator, and the survivors don't care a hoot about him. Comins argues that men who are unjustly accused can sometimes gain from the experience. They have a lot of pain, but it is not a pain that I would necessarily have spared them. I think it ideally initiates a process of self-exploration. How do I see women? If I didn't violate her, could I have? Do I have the potential to do to her what they say I did? Those are good questions. Wow, what some, uh, what some amazing quotes we've got here. Uh, Gina, Gina Ryfield. Um, fantastic. So this is the typical feminist talking point where all men are oppressive monsters who, uh, who see women as um, lesser beings, as being unequal to them and uh, just want to dominate them and all this other fucking bullshit. Which is what we often get with feminism as opposed to actually talking about equality. They, so many feminists seem to be so obsessed with the uh, stereotype of the evil dominating male that they, um, they seem to forget about the equality part quite often. But then we have the quotes from the student. If a woman did falsely accuse a man of rape, she may ha have had a reason to. Maybe she wasn't raped, but he clearly violated her in some way. Wow, isn't that interesting? So, he obviously deserved the false rape allegation. Even if it's not true, he must have done something to upset her. So, you know, he must have deserved it. Maybe he broke up with her and broke her heart. And according to this student, she would be perfectly justified in making a false allegation. Because, well, that would be a violation, wouldn't it? And she even describes rape as non-sexual forms of oppression. So rape doesn't have to be sex now. That's, um, that's interesting. But the real goldmine comes from Catherine Commons. Assistant Dean, <laughs> no less. We're not talking about some airhead student or someone on Tumblr or something like this. This is an assistant dean. And she actually says that men are f who are falsely accused can sometimes gain from the experience. <laughs> they have a lot of pain, but it is not a pain that I would necessarily have spared them. Wow, isn't that fantastic? So, <laughs> it, it's actually good for men to go through that type of pain. Fantastic. That's... That's the type of person that I would want as assistant dean. Clearly she is looking out for the rights of all students, um, including those male ones. And she just wants to, you know, broaden their experience of pain. <laughs> ah. But this type of bullshit comes from rape hysteria which is presently on campus uh, not to mention in the broader community and that rape hysteria comes from people like you Garrett you see Garrett false claims like you made earlier in this video you know the 97 percent one it's claims like that which promote this type of bullshit which promote the taking away of due process which promote the violation of people's human rights to a fair trial. It's, it's basically fear-mongering. That's what it is. Uh, and that's, that's why we have a problem with it. Now, that's not to say that rape isn't a problem. Of course, it is a problem, and it is a problem we need to deal with. 
but hysteria has never in the history of mankind been a positive way to deal with a fucking issue and violating a student's basic rights basic legal rights is no fucking way to deal with an issue you are not making things better you are making things worse but you know the the really strange thing about all this stuff happening on campus is there are actually a lot of feminists out there who are actively promoting rape on campus on campuses right across america there are feminists who are willingly promoting rape <laughs> you may think this is a very strange claim to make uh, but it is actually true I should specify though they are actually promoting a type of rape let's have a look Brooks a controversial monologue February is to full swing and at college campuses across America the festivities of V-Day are set to begin multiple groups across Dartmouth have planned a myriad events for V-Week which will culminate in performances of the vagina monologues here at Dartmouth the performances are produced at the behest of students with help from the Center for Women and Gender. However, one particular monologue in the play seems to be at odds with the goals of the students and groups involved in the production. The little coochie snorker that could, is centered on the true story of a woman who, throughout her youth, suffers many traumatic experiences involving her vagina. She is violently raped at the age of 10 and later comes to view her vagina negatively. In the original version of the play, the girl is befriended at the age of 13 by a 24-year-old woman who convinces the girl's mother to allow her daughter to spend the night. Back at her apartment, the woman plies the girl with alcohol, and the girl says, The alcohol has gone to my head, and I'm loose and ready. The woman proceeds to sexually assault her performing oral sex on her and making her play with herself. Reflecting on what happened to her, the girl later says, if it was a rape, it was a good rape. The initial backlash at the sexual assault of a young girl and the idea of a good rape eventually led the author, Eve and Sir, to make some changes in the monologue. The line about a good rape was removed and the girl's age was raised to 16. However, the use of alcohol in the monologue was left intact. Also left intact was the celebratory and justified tone of the assault. The events described in the coochie snorker, even the new version are at odds with V-Day's stated goals of ending violence against women and girls. Often the people most involved in sexual assault education and in providing support for victims are the ones most involved in the production of the play. Too often, these people feel the need to defend the show as a whole, and either ignore the problematic elements of the coochie snorker, or outright defend the issues. I'm happy to say that as far as Dartmouth is concerned, those I talk to in CWG and SAAP see the same problems in this monologue, and indeed, mention other aspects of the vagina monologues that they found problematic. There will be a vagina controversies discussion during V Week that will address these issues and receptions after the performances to highlight any concerns. However, while CWG and SAAP are receptive to problems with the vagina monologues, I found the reaction of some of the students involved to be problematic. In an interview with Dartbeat, the actress performing, the coochie snorker, said of the girl who is raped, when she meets the woman at the end of the monologue and becomes a sexual being willingly, it's the first time that her coochie snorker becomes a beautiful thing she makes it her own. To view this as a willing sexual experience is to ignore the law and the perpetrator's course of use of alcohol. Multiple students with whom I spoke have stressed that, although the experience isn't politically correct, the girl is able to define it for herself. However, the problem with the scene isn't political correctness. This isn't the story of an interracial lesbian couple applying for a marriage license in Mississippi. The problem is that the experience meets the legal parameters for sexual assault. Victims of sexual violence can view their assaults in many different ways, and some argue that this monologue reflects a victim's point of view. However, the diversity of victims' experiences is not what is stressed and celebrated in The Coochie Snorker. The defense of the sexual assault by some of those involved in the monologue doesn't coincide with this interpretation. 
The conversations I had with women involved with the production highlighted many positive facets of performing the play, which include sparking conversation about female sexuality, celebrating women's bodies, providing an outlet for victims of sexual assault and raising money to end violence against women. The Vagina Controversies Discussion represents a positive development for V Week as it provides an opportunity to talk about the problems with this monologue. The negative aspects and subsequent defenses of a small part of a generally positive program harm the positive whole of V Day and damage the credibility of those people and groups that defend the monologue. If it was a rape, it was a good rape. Hmm. Very interesting, isn't it? Look, let me acknowledge that yes, there are some feminists out there who are criticizing this and I give them full credit for doing so uh, could you imagine though um, if it was a play about a 24 year old man who lured a 13 year old girl to his, his uh, apartment or his house he got her blind drunk on alcohol and then proceeded to perform oral sex on her or any other type of sex actually do you still think it would be called a good rape <laughs> do you think that it would be celebrated on universities across America or do you think maybe feminists would be burning the books in bonfires and claiming it's part of rape culture and uh, used as an example of toxic masculinity and the the evil patriarchy it'd be a, a perfect example of how evil men are right but um but it's different when a woman does it now look at, at this point you might be saying yeah but look it's just a play you know it's it's not real life but if we look at the court system and how they treat female rapists uh and i'm talking specifically about the the ones that prey on young children um, often they're teachers, by the way, so they're given that duty of care which they violate. If we look at the way the court systems treat them, they treat them very differently than they would a man in the same situation. Um, that's what we would call a double standard. And it's strange because often when this is brought up, we, we hear from feminists that, oh, yeah, but that's part of patriarchy. It's patriarchy doing that because women are seen as less capable of raping because of patriarchy or, or some such excuse. It always seems to be patriarchy, doesn't it? But if that's the case, then aren't the feminists who are celebrating the vagina monologues uh, celebrating patriarchy? <laughs> aren't they celebrating a female rapist? Interesting, isn't it? Now, Garrett... Um, I'm unsure if you agree with any of my points. You might agree with all of them. You might agree with some of them. You might not agree with any of them. In which case, I'm looking forward to a, a response video from you. But let's, for argument's sake, say that you agree with at least some of them, or generally agree with me, that there is a problem in the university system and that due process is important. Let's let's hope you agree with me on that. But let's just assume for argument's sake that you do, right? I'm guessing your next argument is going to be something like, but Bain, there are still so many women being raped and the rapists are getting away with it. And you know what? I would agree with you. This is a problem. This is something which needs to be solved. Uh, but the thing is, I see two major barriers standing in the way of actually solving this problem. The first one we can actually do something about. The second one is much harder. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, listen to a solution if you've got one. But let's start with the first barrier. Uh, the first barrier is twofold. Firstly, if the statistics from RAIN are in fact correct. And I'm a little sus about them because it's it's a phone survey so the numbers might actually be higher or lower or who knows but let's for argument's sake say that the rain statistics are correct then the majority of rape victims don't report their rapes and if you don't report your rape then you can't have a prosecution and you can't put someone in jail effectively they get away with it 
the second part of this is that often rape victims delay reporting their rapes maybe a week maybe a month in some cases years and when you do this you greatly decrease your chances of actually getting a conviction any evidence of an assault is long gone memories might be a bit more fuzzy people might get dates wrong you're far less likely to get a conviction now look I fully understand why someone would either delay reporting or not report at all. Um, I can't imagine what someone in that position must be going through and then to have to get a medical examination and answer questions and and go through all the red tape and all the bullshit which is required. <sighs> Look, I can I can fully understand why someone would just want to avoid it and not do it or maybe not be ready for it straight away I, I can fully understand that I I fully understand why someone would delay doing it unfortunately that increases the chances of the rapist getting off if you do that then the likelihood of the rapist being convicted is far far less that's just the simple truth I don't really know what we can do to get around that apart from encourage women to come forward and talk about their rapes and report their rapes to the police. Obviously, if more rapes were reported to police, then there would be more prosecutions and that would end in more convictions. And as uh, many, if not most, rapists are serial rapists, that would prevent future rapes. But this requires women coming forward and talking to the police right after it's happened the sooner the better not delaying days or weeks or months or even years but as soon as possible unfortunately there's something standing in the way of this happening and that Garrett is people like you who come out with 97 percent of prosecutions don't end in the conviction <sighs> That one little bullshit statistic that you threw in earlier, when people like yourself use that, you are actually deterring people from coming forward. You are actually creating the problem that you're fighting against. You are actually making things worse. You're fear-mongering, you're creating hysteria, and you're making it harder for people to come forward. I mean, fucking hell, if, if you actually believed, right, if you were a rape victim and you'd been told and you believed that 97% of, of court cases when it comes to rape don't end in a conviction, why the fuck would you come forward? Why the fuck would you bother? Why would you put yourself through all that trauma and answering questions and the physical examination to collect evidence and, and all the other shit that goes with it why would you fucking bother doing that if some some guy on the internet or some feminist somewhere or some feminist organization has told you that 97 percent of rape cases don't end in a conviction fucking hell Garrett do you not do you not see this as an issue do you not see this as part of the problem why would someone come forward when they're being told such bullshit why would they come forward when they've been fear-mongered that way? When they're a victim of fucking hysteria? I'd really like to know. I'd like to know your answer to that. That would be great if you can answer that question. And possibly, you know, maybe you and other feminists like you could stop doing it. That might actually help the situation. Just a bit, do you think? But the second barrier, uh, that one's much harder to fix. As I talked about earlier, um, often in rape cases, it comes down to one person's word against another. Now, this is even more so if the reporting of the rape is delayed. All right, If you delay reporting it for a month or a year or even a week, maybe even days, the likelihood of collecting evidence is zero you know if there's physical evidence that sex has taken place it's not probably going to be evidence of rape but it's at least supporting the woman's claim 
There may be evidence of trauma, evidence of a struggle taking place. But unfortunately, more often than not, it comes down to one person's word against another. And when you're dealing with one person's word against another, one person says there was consent, the other person says there wasn't. I don't know how we can improve the system to the point where we can determine in a better way who is telling the truth. Can you think of an idea, Garrett? Do you have a way to fix this? Do you have a way of somehow determining in a court of law who is telling the truth when it's one person's word against another? Because if you do, I'd really like to hear it. I'd fucking love to hear it, mate. And I think everyone watching this would love to know your solution to this problem. Because as long as it's one person's word against another, unfortunately, there are going to be some people who get away with it. And I honestly don't know how to fix that. I don't know how to change that in some way to make that better. And to be perfectly honest, I don't think anyone does. Unfortunately, though, uh, many feminists seem to have a solution. And that is you throw out the very cornerstone of our legal system and you just take the victim's word for it. Well, if the victim's female, at least in some cases as we saw earlier in the university where the <laughs> male was passed out yet uh, somehow was the rapist. So what you do is you just take the, the woman's word for it, the rape victim's word for it, and you throw out all due process and you just assume that the accused is guilty. I mean, why even give him legal representation, right? Now, I, I know at the moment this is just happening in universities and they don't really have any authority to, to give anyone a real sentence. There are many people on your side of the fence who would like to see it in our legal system and they're pushing for it. And they're of the philosophy that you should always believe the victim. Always. Even when the victim is proven to be lying that you still believe their original claim and just assume that the person's guilty. Four men were charged with five counts of rape and police were looking for a fifth man. The four men pleaded not guilty and were held on a half million dollar bond. If convicted, all faced up to 25 years in prison. A few days later, she recants her story. The suspects were released and the charges were dropped. The 18 year old freshman later told officials the sexual encounter was consensual. We have three of those men that were charged and held. Let's meet them now. Jesus, Stalin, and Arvin. Now, falsely accused, right? So definitely not no booing matter because this is a very sensitive subject. You know what I'm saying? We came out to, came out to support Chai and we gained booze. I really didn't want to come out here and next thing you know, I have people booing me. But no. I, I, and I agree with you. Why is there a particular reason why anybody wants to say why they booed? You come to speak to the mic. I booed for a good reason. I have been sexually assaulted, and I know what it's like. It's not cool. And if you guys are lying about it, that's not right. I know what it's like. It's not cool. Basically, the story is recanted. So did you have sex with this thing? Is to the young lady. Um, I'm Stalin Flipper, by the way. Um, I apologize that you've been assaulted before, that's not all fault, but I do apologize for that matter, but there was a video that proved that the sex was consensual, and she even said herself that it was all a lie, she actually lied, because she was called by her boyfriend. So she told him to lie, to let you know her what? I'm, I'm... Hi, alright, so honestly I'm torn right now, and I don't know whether or not I believe you guys, and apparently this video is what's going to save you. But you said you took it on a phone, so how long did the video last? 40 seconds, 50 seconds? Who is to say that those two guys that are having sex with her, four more didn't join in? Um, like how... If, if, it, if, if it, it was a lie, we wouldn't be here right now. The girl, the girl, <laughs> the girl has recanted the story. The story. She, she's, she said, she, I mean, I'm just, it's, she admitted that she didn't want her boyfriend to find out and that's why she made up the story maybe she's scared that if she says that she was raped how, how that's scared? something that wait 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 wait, 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 wait. How, how scared is she 
than us. We was doing 25 years, so how, how much scared of she can be with us? We do 25 years, so what are we scared about? <laughs> This is fucking insanity, and it goes against the very cornerstone of our legal system. This is why we talk out about this shit, Garrett. This is why we talk about false rape claims, because the cornerstone of our legal system is important. It is a fundamental part of our legal system. It is a fundamental part of our rights in the West to have a fair trial to face our accuser to have legal representation and not be convicted just on someone's word without any way of defending yourself unfortunately it's not a perfect system sometimes guilty people get away with it and, and not just for rape but for all crimes that's the cost we pay for having the assumption of innocent until proven guilty. That's the cost we pay for having a system based on evidence before we convict someone. That's the cost we pay for giving people legal representation and a right to defend themselves. It's that fucking simple. Now if you have a better way of doing it, by all means, please tell me. I look forward to you telling us all, Garrett. By all means, please do. That is, if it's a better way that doesn't take away basic legal rights of the individual. I don't think that's too much to ask, is it, mate? Yeah, yeah, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, look, Bane, you, you've already done an hour and 15, which is a lot more than what I originally thought I would end up doing, but I, I guess I just got carried away. Um, but you're thinking, shit, Bane, you've done an hour and 15, and now you're adding even more to the end. Yep, I'll try to be quick. But just having gone through and reviewed uh, what I've done so far, there's a couple of additional points I'd like to make just little ones here and there the first one is between somewhere between the 13 and 14 minute mark where I'm talking about Garrett uh, misinterpreting the 97% of rapists don't end up in jail as 97% of rapists who go to trial don't end up in jail obviously these two figures are completely different and I say something about Garrett getting these figures from Rain, and I show a uh, graphic that Garrett used from Rain, and it says 98%. So you're probably wondering why I'm associating the 97% claim with a graphic which says 98%. Yes, I did admit earlier that my math skills are a bit rusty, but yes, I do know the difference between... 97% and 98%. But if we go back around a year or so, um, the statistics that Rain were using did include 97%, not 98 And as far as I know, the 97% figure was around for quite some time. So obviously there's still a lot of people on the internet and a lot of web pages, etc., uh, who used a 97% figure. So I'm guessing that's where Garrett got the 97% figure from and then through a mistake misinterpreted that that statistic. Of course if I'm wrong about this Garrett and uh, you did get that 97% figure from somewhere else by all means feel free to leave a link below and I'm more than happy to have a look at it. And of course, if you can prove that 97% of uh, people who go to trial over rape end up walking free, and, and that proof is uh, legitimate, I'm more than happy to admit I'm wrong. Although I, I'm pretty fucking confident this is a mistake on your behalf. So let's have another quick look at the other graphic that Garrett used. Uh, I, I actually hunted down the 
entire graphic so we can have a look at the entire thing and not just the bottom bit that Garrett presented to us. So I never actually had a look at the other side of the graphic. It says over here 7% of reported rapes are convicted. And if we have a look at the comparisons over here, uh, it's compared to 6%, 12% and 27%. Well, clearly it's a long way from 27%, but it is uh, fairly close to 6 and 12, I would argue. So the percentage of rapes which are reported, which then go on to be convicted, is similar to burglary and theft. I would assume that the higher rate of conviction for violent offences would be because of physical evidence, you know, broken nose or black eyes or, or whatever. Many of these are also probably public and have numerous witnesses possibly even video footage um, because you know let's face it there's a lot of violence associated with uh, alcohol so often this happens at clubs or events where there are where alcohol is being served and might also have to do with people actually reporting the violent offenses um, straight afterwards obviously if you wait six months and then go and report that someone beat you and you don't have any actual evidence as far as bruises or anything then you're far less likely to get a conviction but it's interesting to see even in the case of violent offences the vast majority of reported cases still don't end in a conviction of course not everything that's reported goes to trial some cases might be too weak to go to trial some may be false some might be withdrawn so let's go up and actually have a look at parts of the graphic that Garrett did not show us. Because there's some very, very interesting stuff here. We see 16,000 cases which are reported, and then underneath 13,000 not prosecuted, which is a huge number. So what are the reasons why these cases aren't prosecuted? So on one side we have why are cases lost at police stage and the top reason is victim withdrawal 34%. Now it breaks down the figure on the other side and the top two reasons are do not want to go through with it or wants to move on. So 34% of cases which are dropped are due to the claimant, the person who is the victim, withdrawing the case. The next biggest reason underneath is 21%, which is insufficient evidence. And the third one is offender not identified. Obviously, if you don't know who the offender is, uh, you, you can't actually take them to trial, can you? And interestingly enough, it's actually got 12% here as false allegation, which is a little bit different than uh, the 2 to 8% quoted by Garrett earlier. Still, I, I wouldn't say that that is a, um, a rock-solid uh, number, as you could argue that there might be cases within insufficient evidence or victim withdrawn, which might also be false allegations. So when we actually go to the prosecution, 34% of the cases are withdrawn by the victim. 52% of cases discontinued by prosecution. That's interesting. I'd, I'd love a further breakdown of that. I, I think the reasons why would be quite interesting. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us here. And then we have 12% of offenders cautioned or given reprimand. Now, I find that an interesting figure. Um, I don't know why a rapist would be cautioned or given a reprimand. Although, admittedly, I have seen this quite a few times in cases involving statutory rape, uh, usually with a female offender, often a teacher uh, who has taken advantage of a student. Um, unfortunately, it's all too common for them to be given a slap on the wrist. There was a case with an adult babysitter recently who uh, had sex from memory with an 11 year old boy and the judge said that she was very immature for her age and the boy was very mature and therefore it was somehow his fault and it was just a slap on the wrist. There may also be cases of statutory rape where the age difference between the two people uh, involved isn't really that great 
uh, and both parties are willing participants, but because the law in that area is rather restrictive, uh, it is legally seen as rape. You know, where you've got maybe a a 19-year-old and a 17-year-old or something, and the 17-year-old is a, is two weeks off her birthday or, or something like that. Quite possibly, it might also involve um, alcohol, where one person claims to be intoxicated and the other person was also intoxicated and it's really hard to tell uh, what actually happened. But once again I'd like to see a, a breakdown of that number because I think it would be quite interesting. So we only have 18% of reported rapes that come to trial uh, but obviously there are a lot of reasons why the other 72% don't. The main ones seem to be either the victim withdrawing or insufficient evidence. Obviously claiming that 97% of prosecuted rapes don't end in a conviction uh, isn't going to encourage victims to go through the court system. Not that I think that is the only uh, thing stopping victims going through the court system, but it most definitely doesn't help. Now when we come to the outcomes, which Garrett showed us the very bottom of, we have 36% not guilty. Now I think it's only fair to argue that in many of these cases, possibly the majority of these cases, the accused is actually guilty and there's just insufficient evidence. Of course it's also reasonable to argue that there may be false allegations amongst this number and there just is insufficient evidence to prove that the allegation is false. Once again, unfortunately, most rape cases fall into the unknown category where they are neither proven to be true or false. We simply don't know. Needless to say, if someone has not been proven guilty in a court of law, then we should not presume that they are guilty. But it is uh, only reasonable to assume that sometimes guilty people do get away with their crime. Of course, this applies to both rapists and false accusers. And we have 24% which is discontinued. So, as we saw above, the reason why cases are discontinued is the victim has withdrawn or the prosecutor has discontinued the case. Now, once again, I'd, I'd love to see why that is. I'd love to see a breakdown of that number, which unfortunately we don't get here. So if we look at the not guilty and the discontinued, that adds up to 60%, which makes perfect sense when you consider that 40% of those prosecuted end in the conviction. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this is uh, data from the UK, and I think Rain gets their data from America. So let's compare the 40% with the Rain figures. And I'm going to use the graphic that Garrett himself used in his video. So out of every 100 rapes, 32 get reported to police, 7 lead to an arrest, 3 are referred to prosecutors, 2 lead to a felony conviction, and 2 rapists will spend a single day in prison. So if we take the 3 are referred to prosecutors, and then we look at the number of rapists who actually go to prison once they go to trial, we find that it is two-thirds or 66%. So if we now compare the 66% to other crimes, which uh, Garrett pointed out in his, his graphic, we see 70% for burglary, 68% for violent offences, and 85% for theft. So I know I'm comparing American figures to uh, UK figures but I just find, find it interesting that the going by the rain statistics uh, the percentages aren't that far off compared to other crimes and of course Garrett's big point was that so few prosecuted rapes end in a conviction uh, it doesn't actually seem that way I also think it'd be interesting to see a breakdown of the rain figures in a similar way that we've seen the UK figures broken down here uh, to see why it's 40% in the UK and 66% in America. Are victims just less likely to withdraw their case in America? 
Is there a, a greater standard for evidence when it comes to the UK system? There's lots of questions here we could be asking and I'd, I'd like to see the figures for that. It'd be very interesting. I think you'll all agree that these statistics aren't as simple and straightforward as people like Garrett tend to present them. It's often claimed that so few rapists are actually convicted because of uh, rape culture and discrimination against women and patriarchy and all the rest of it. Uh, the reality is quite different. The very nature of rape makes it a, an extremely hard case to prove and to prosecute. Now that doesn't mean that there might not be uh, some forms of sexism in the system. Um, obviously this is going to be more prominent in some places around the world than others. But to say that it's systematic right across the Western world uh, is just ludicrous. Especially when you don't take into consideration so many other factors. Even more so when your own ideology is making it harder for, for actual victims to go through the system in the first place. But Garrett does mention rape and MRAs at one other point in his video. The chunk of video in which that appears um, I'll be debunking in my next video to Garrett. But considering it does concern rape and MRAs, I might as well edit that little bit out and take care of it here. Take it away, Garrett. If you look at the whole false rape accusation epidemic myth that some MRAs love to drone on about, that is the perfect example of how the MRM alienates feminists, people who have experience successfully fighting for gender-specific causes and could be potentially of great assistance to MRAs. They go on about this and say stuff like 90% of rape accusations are false or date rape is just bad sex. And for anyone about to jump in with Thunderfoot isn't an MRA, he's made many videos discussing their talking points and focusing on men's rights causes, so his lack of willingness to identify as an MRA outright just goes to illustrate my point about the label being poisonous. Anyway, back to what I was saying. Okay, so look, I'll deal with the Thunderfoot is an MRA claim next video, right? <laughs> oh boy. Um, so, alright, let, let's put that part aside and let's concentrate on the 90% of rapes uh, false claim supposedly made by MRAs. Now, when I heard this, I was fully intending to <laughs> rip Garrett apart for you know, making such a claim, as I've never actually heard an MRA make that claim before. But a word of advice to anyone out there who <laughs> is going to argue against someone else, you should always make sure that the point you're arguing is actually accurate. So I actually jumped online and did a search to try to find the 90% claim. And it seems that there is one MRA who has made the claim in the past. The claim appeared on Angry Harry. Um, there's probably some of you who have never heard of Angry Harry. Uh, he, uh, he was around before I was. Um, I don't, to be honest, I don't know a great deal about him. But I think probably sometime in the last 10 years he started to write his, his blog. And back in the early days of the present wave of men's rights, um, he was fairly well known. Now, I'll admit I've never actually read any of Angry Harry's stuff before, so I'm not overly familiar with it. And in this particular post, The Truth About Rape Statistics, he does make the claim that 90% of accusations are false. He, he actually says more than 90% of allegations are false. Uh, let me just say this is pure bullshit. There's a lot of... Um, logical problems about this article uh, quite possibly I'll do a video on it in the future or maybe maybe do a hangout and uh, with a couple of others and we can go through and discuss it uh, one point I would like to make though one logical fallacy that he tends to make he assumes that each individual rape is done by an individual man as opposed to multiple rapes done by one individual now, unfortunately, this is a common mistake, and it does change statistics and the way you look at things rather drastically. It's the exact same mistake that Rain makes, by the way, and I've actually criticised them for this in the past. 
they claim that out of every 100 rapes, 98 rapists will never spend a single day in prison. This is actually incorrect. A better way of putting it, or the more accurate way of putting it, is out of every 100 rapes, 98 will not result in a conviction. Now, some of you might not understand the difference between these two things, but there actually is a large difference. Let's have a look at something like um, shoplifting, for example. Now, some people who shoplift may get caught the first time, but I think it's reasonable to speculate that most shoplifters will shoplift many, many times before they get caught, if they ever get caught at all. And this is exactly the same for many crimes. There are many crimes where people will commit them multiple times before getting caught, having a trial, being found guilty and sent to jail, if if that is the appropriate punishment for the crime. And rape is no different. So if you look at 100 rapes, we are not looking at 100 rapists. We are looking at far less than that because many of those 100 rapes will have been committed by someone who has committed multiple rapes and has got away with those rapes numerous times. Obviously the fact that only 32% of rapes are reported to police does not help this. And as we saw in the previous set of statistics, even when the rape is reported to police, 13% of offenders are not identified. Now some of you may think I'm being pedantic, but this actually does dramatically change the way you look at figures. And Angry Harry makes the exact same mistake here, assuming every rape is committed by an individual man as opposed to a serial rapist. Uh, but by no means is that the only logic fault in uh, this particular article. And um, I have no problem saying it's bullshit. Now if someone were to say something like up to 90% of rapes could be false allegations. Actually, it would probably be more accurate to say something like 94%. Then technically that is true. You could also say the opposite, that up to 92% of rape allegations are true. In fact, that's basically what we hear from the feminist side all the time when they consider that all allegations are in fact true, even if they haven't been proven in a court of law, and even if the complaint's been withdrawn or, or whatever. They just make the assumption that an accusation equals guilt. Uh, my position is very, very clear. If I haven't made it clear already in this video, then in the vast majority of cases, we simply do not know one way or the other. And anyone who says 90-something percent of cases definitely are false or 90 something percent of cases are definitely true is full of shit. Yeah. That includes Garrett and that includes Angry Harry. Now there is one other point I'll try to make quickly and that's in regards to the vagina monologues and the use of alcohol. Now there's been a, a lot of discussion in recent years about intoxication and rape so let me just start by saying that yes, there is clearly a point where someone is far too intoxicated to give consent. I know of two cases uh, involving friends. Uh, one was when I was 21, this is back in the 90s. I was at a nightclub with some friends and I spotted one of my friends being carried out by, uh, how shall I put it, two rather rotund um, females. They were rather large, they were actually carrying him out. Uh, his arms were around their shoulders. Uh, his head was lolling side to side. And um, his legs were literally being dragged. And they were heading towards the front door with him. Now a friend and I stepped in and said, you know, what the fuck's going on here? We took our friend into the, the bathroom, put his head in the sink and proceeded to splash cold water on his face for the next half an hour trying to revive him and it took about that long for him to finally realize where the fuck he was. If we hadn't come along at that point and they had have 
taken him home, uh, clearly he was not in a state to give any type of consent. And a, another case involving a friend, uh, this also happened back in the 90s, he went to a mate's party at his mate's house, he had way too much to drink, and he went and crashed on his friend's bed. And when he woke up some time later, there was a woman having sex with him. Clearly he wasn't in a state to give consent, not only being that drunk, but also being asleep. Now my friend was in a relationship at this time, and apparently the woman having sex with him uh, was jealous. She wanted to be with him, and thought that would be a good way to break them up. Yeah, you you have a crush on someone, you just you rape them when they're asleep, right? That's a, that's a good idea. Of course, society and the law really don't consider these things to be rape when they're involving a man, do they? I mean, uh, forced to penetrate isn't really considered rape, is it? But clearly there is a state, if you have drank too much, where you cannot give consent. And at the other end of the spectrum, clearly uh, people can have alcohol and still be capable of giving consent if you have um, a couple of beers or some spirits or whatever uh, you can still be in control of yourself and uh, fully capable of giving consent uh, of course how much alcohol someone can drink before they're incapable of giving consent uh, changes from person to person so now that we've talked about the two extremes um, let's all admit that there is a gray area in between where it might be hard to tell if someone is too intoxicated or not. Someone may actually be the aggressor, be the one making the moves, and appear to be in control enough to give consent. And of course, the other person may be equally drunk, and finding that line where someone is too drunk to give consent may be difficult in those circumstances. Now, having said all this, there are some feminists out there, and I'm not saying all feminists, let me stress that, but there are some feminists out there who do claim that if a woman has consumed any amount of alcohol, she is incapable of giving any type of consent. So, any amount of alcohol would, con would be one beer, right? Of course, this doesn't only infantilise women saying that, you know, if they consume any amount of alcohol, they're incapable of making any decision. Uh, of course, the same standards are never applied to men. But it's also interesting in the context of the vagina monologues, where the girl in the play is clearly too drunk to give consent, even if she was old enough to give consent, which she wasn't. So I find this incredibly hypocritical, that we spend so much time talking about alcohol and consent, yet... This play is still performed on universities across America. But it's different when it's a female victimizer, isn't it? Strange that. 